Vegetative therapy talks about the function of the orgasm and emotional disturbances caused by disturbances to this function, etc. Um, I'm just going to scroll this down a bit. Uh, so the goal of psychoanalysis is a discovery of unconscious emotional mechanisms. The goal of vegetative therapy is discovery of the vegetative physical mechanisms, etc. All of this is in Reich Speaks of Freud. I gather that for some of you that's a new book. I strongly encourage you to read it in, um, in that book on pages 270, 274. I'm done with <laughs> my one of three. <laughs> so, Eric, um, well, uh, two quick questions for me, and then I'm turning it over to Eric. Any questions? Maybe no quick questions. That's fine with me, too. That's a good, que that's a good question, and I'm not sure of the answer. Well, here you see in an article from 1938 called Sex Economy and Vegetotherapy. So he's at least using it by 1938. In the beginning of the function of the orgasm, he says, I really should have called this orgasm therapy. But I didn't want to do that because I was concerned that young practitioners starting out practicing something called orgasm therapy, it might cause too much confusion. Hold on one second. Make a note and then when you get your shot, okay? Um, so it's a, he's at least using it by then. And he's talking about vegetative currents. Actually, the phrase vegetative currents goes back to uh, Friedrich Krauss, and I'll talk about him in my second lecture. Uh, any other quick questions before uh, Dr. Weitzner? Then you'll get your turn, Dr. Lewis, and you can explain further. Um, okay, I'm going to yield the floor to my esteemed colleague from the New York Psychoanalytic Association, where he's the president, and uh, no, he's none of those things. <laughs> I was treasurer for a while. You were treasurer. <laughs> Do, do you want to wear a Freud's original slip, or do you want to just... I, 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 I'm suspicious of that uh, image, because I think he must have had a slip at a much earlier age. He was born with a beard and oh, glasses. Where, where did he go? Oh, gosh. This thing is bugging I mean, me. It's tragic if he only had his first slip and he already had a beard. <laughs> where is his slip? I don't understand why it keeps closing. Uh, well, I can't show you a slip right now for some reason. Oh, here, here's, here's a, pardon me? Uh, I think this is annoying to me now. Well, come ahead and come and speak to us, friend. Oh, I know what I need. Here we go. There he is. There he is in his new slip. But note the two-tone shoes. Um, it looks like a chicken or a woman. <laughs> it's his mother. It's his mother. It's a woman, but is she wearing a slip as well? It's a good question. Good question. You're on. You get to look at Wolfie while he talks. Where should I sit? You can come up here. You can stand, sit. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, what I should say. <clears throat> now, let's start with the easy things. I mean, since people were curious about the cocaine, uh, I know a little bit about it. He used cocaine on <clears throat> himself. Now, he was uh, actually one of the um, people responsible for the discovery of the anesthetic properties of cocaine. And I believe it was Freud who had the idea that cocaine could be used as a topical anesthetic to do eye surgery. But he never, did, he never did the work himself. He never got credit for it. Uh, Harry? No, just quick, quick. He actually had a paper that was prepared to be published somewhere for that. Oh, yeah? The summer, he was preparing it the summer before the guy who got credit for it published the paper. So he had actually done some work on it. He, he, he really was the one that developed it. Yeah, I guess, I'm, I, guess I, I, most recent, I guess I read about it in Jones' uh, biography. Jones, Jones is... Jones and Jones, Jones implies that Freud never really did the work. Uh, that he was trying to distance Freud from cocaine. He was yeah. as, as Phil Bennett pointed out, yeah. was incredibly uh, uptight and questionable human being. And he lied. The biography... Yeah, I, I, don't, biography I, I don't doubt that. <clears throat> but anyway, Freud, uh, Freud was himself... Freud himself, of course, had a neurosis. He had a, he had a phobia. 
a train phobia. And, he was, and when he did his self-analysis in 1897, he was able to figure out why he had this phobia of trains. But he also suffered from mild dysphoric states, kind of mild depression. And knowing about cocaine from the laboratory, he, 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 uh, he, I think he injected himself with tiny quantities of the stuff, and it worked. It's the same if you took a tiny dose of Ritalin, you know, in, in a state of mild depression. It might give you a boost and you'd feel well. And Freud was able to do that on himself successfully. But then he had a friend, a physician who was in a tragic accident and developed chronic pain uh, in, in some part of his body, uh, which, which had been injured. And he started, he, he started treating himself with opiates, uh, probably morphine, and he became an opiate addict. And Freud was interested in the idea that, that by giving somebody cocaine, you could wean the person off opium, and the cocaine would then somehow have a, you know, a, a euphoric effect. And so he, start, he gave his, his friend cocaine, and the friend then became a cocaine addict and was taking like doses of cocaine, which Freud had never heard of before, because he was giving himself like tiny, tiny fractions of a, of a milligram. And his friend was taking huge amounts, you know, like, like, like speedballing. <laughs> and the friend eventually committed suicide. It's not obvious that it was directly because of his cocaine addiction, but Freud felt very responsible and guilty and, and realized at that point that cocaine was not the panacea for anything. Uh, is not a way of treating depression nor a way of curing uh, opiate addiction. Um, what was the other easy thing? <laughs> oh, the tele yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I want to say that, that, I, that everything uh, that uh, Philip presented uh, is, I, I would not uh, take issue except with a couple of small things about how psychoanalysis works. But there is one interesting thing about the philosophy. Uh, it's absolutely true that Freud and Reich were both materialists, empiricists, rationalists, um, scientists, and so forth. But it's not well, very well known, and I'm not sure myself what to make of it, uh, that Freud wrote a couple of papers on telepathy. Did you know that? He wrote papers on telepathy. And Freud believed in telepathy. And he, but, and this was a great, of great distress to his colleagues like Jones. Uh, Jones and, his, and company were also very distressed that Freud, to, to the end of his days, as far and here Phil probably knows better than I do, was a Lamarckian. He believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And as if he had never heard of the experiments of, of, of Mendel, uh, Mendelian genetics, uh, chromosomes or genes or whatever, whatever, whatever they were beginning to, dis to discover. <laughs> he was what? He was a neurologist, but he was supposed to be a neurologist. Freud? But he was involved with Fleece. Fleece was a... a yes, a that's true, a Fleece, right. And, and the letters show that Freud supported... But wasn't it Fleece who also had this kooky... Wasn't Fleece an otolaryngologist? Yeah, 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 Fleece had this kooky idea that there was some relation between the ear, nose, and throat, and, uh, and sex, they and the road. They almost killed a woman during surgery. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, Freud, Freud, Freud's belief in telepathy, did, in my opinion, did not, does not disprove the idea that he was a rationalist, because Freud believed in, in, that the unconscious was something extremely deep and, and uh, mysterious and, and hard to grasp. And one of Freud's great contributions to psychology, if not his, the greatest contribution, was the idea that conscious mental experience was only a tiny, tiny, tiny tip of the iceberg of, of, of mental experience. That the mind was like very, very much uh, an unconscious automatic process. And what we know consciously, and what we perceive and can process in our intellect, is just a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Uh, and so he believed that when people uh, had a, when somebody had a dream and the dream came true that there was every possibility that, that the unconscious of the, of, the, of the dreamer was somehow in tune 
with the unconscious of the person who was represented in the dream. Uh, and he had examples, clinical examples from his own practice where a patient, for example, uh, knew something about him that nobody knew and that somehow Freud had communicated to him unconsciously during a session or some other way. Of course, you could explain it some other way. You, 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 there are other explanations than telepathy for, for these phenomena. You, you need not be a barrister. That's right. You need not, indeed. And, and, and one of the great things about Freud, in which he had in common with Reich, was that he went all the way, jusqu'au bout, the French say, that when he saw that the best, the most parsimonious and logical explanation for a phenomenon was telepathy, he, he wrote it. He published the paper. He didn't give a damn that Jones was embarrassed. And when he saw that the inheritance acquired characteristics based on his reading of anthropology and, and history and, 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 and sociobiology, whatever you would now call it, was that there were you know, these archaic hordes of, 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 of people who, ha who did things which then got somehow incorporated into, um, into their psyches, he, he wrote it. And he didn't give a damn that people <laughs> were discrediting <laughs> Lamarck and studying uh, you know, Mendelian genetics. He wrote what he thought was the, most, the best explanation. And Reich was the same. Reich just had a very, very different point of view. Um, so let me... Uh, do you want me to comment on, on the psychoanalysis part, right? I, I, would, I would, what I was hoping is that you could speak to Reich's, quote, contribution to psychoanalysis or Reich's, that brief part of my paper where I talked about um, uh, negative transference, repression, character analysis, okay. but you're, it's your, whatever you your move to this. All right. Well, let me uh, I, I, let me introduce some concepts which I think are very important in considering this whole question of, of how uh, how psychoanalysis grew under Reich's uh, tutelage into something very different into vegetative therapy and then organ therapy, uh, and how and then what is the relation between the two fields? The the first concept is the idea of a mental apparatus. Freud talked about a mental apparatus. What did he mean by it? Uh, he even drew the mental apparatus. Uh, you know, he, he drew, uh, you know, initially, he drew, the, in, in the interpretation of dreams, he drew the mental apparatus as a line. And that line represented a discharge apparatus, interestingly enough, uh, considering that Reich eventually became so interested in charge and discharge. Um, and the, the apparatus in the interpretation of dreams was the perceptual organ over here that we perceive things and that part of that is sense perception and part of that is consciousness. Uh, and then the, what we perceive uh, the, then uh, gets processed and, and has an effect and, and, and then there is mem and it gets stored in memory and then the memories, some of them get repressed, and then they have more and more effects, and then finally, the, uh, fr from, the, uh, from the perceptual side, you then have a discharge side, and the discharge is the motor apparatus, the endocrine apparatus, and uh, behavior in general. Now, obviously, this is based on the primitive idea of a reflex arc, that, that uh, some, there's a stimulus, and then there's a response, except in the case of the, the mental apparatus, in between the stimulus and response, you have this very complicated uh, process called thinking. And thinking for Freud was, was a delay in, in discharge. So in a primitive organism where you don't have much uh, thinking or any thinking going on, you have a stimulus and you have a response. Uh, in a human being, you can do reflexes. You, have a, you hit over the tendon, and, and you, you get, you get a, a knee jerk. But when you think, you ha you're, you're taking in all kinds of sensory uh, and, and cognitive uh, uh, stimuli, and then you think it through. You mull it over. It has an effect. It interacts with all your experience from the past.